Hello. So I now present to you the Empire Number no. 2 typewriter. This is a thrust action typewriter, as you can see. The type bars, they move straight into the platen, rather than, say, on a railer machine, salter, where they move down, or onto more common machines, where you would rather see them swinging from being prone or on their backs into the platen. So this machine, according to the typewriter database, could have been produced any time between 1914 to 1922. Um, so they don't have that much details on which range of serial numbers were produced in which year. Um, obtained this back in February. This is my 12th machine that I acquired um, for about 300 Canadian on Hybrid. Um, I guess as a Canadian, seeing made in Canada on a typewriter makes me very happy. So um, I very much wanted this machine and absolutely loved the pinstripes on it, as you can see. Nice blue and gold pinstripes. Um, I sure hope that nothing actually deteriorated over its time under my ownership. Um, otherwise, this machine was already capable of typing pretty smoothly when I first got it, but the problem was that whenever you press the shift keys, the torsion spring over here this torsion spring was not tight enough and I was hoping that maybe I just need more lubrication here um, currently the only thing I really use is this liquid wrench and the surf on the deposits back that's a dry lubricant um, doesn't leave behind any gunky film but yeah basically in the end what I really need to do to do was apply some liquid wrench there and work really hard and carefully to get this guy free so that I could carefully stick something in there into that capstan to tighten the spring. Eventually I was able to locate one of those like hex bits for screwdrivers and very carefully and painstakingly tighten this until finally I had myself some quite pleasurable and reliable shift operation. Um, technically, it was that single thing that caused this machine to unfortunately see much neglect compared to my other machines over the past few months. I'm even in recent, like the last two months or so, I've unfortunately been kind of forgetting how nice this machine is, mainly because it was sitting right at the back underneath that chair. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's the only way to actually fit these machines in this living room. I have 12 more downstairs in the basement in a shelf. Anyways, let's talk about the futures. Spacebar. Tabulator. Oh dear. Which somehow for this video decided to stop working. <laughs> Interesting. So when I inverted the machine or put it onto its back, these tabs all decided to come out. So let's put them back for demonstration purposes. Uh, yeah, so I guess the nice thing about this machine is that it's almost impossible to lose these tabs except during, except when servicing it and should you ever have to remove that rail. Which I doubt you should ever need to.
Let's just have all the tabs stuck. You'll see them. It has this little spring loaded thing here, which makes for a nice and cushioned impact. Carriage return isn't too heavy. The nice thing about that mechanism is that it allows you to immediately press the tab again. Because with some typewriters, such as that, um, this guy, my Remington number 10, basically what happens is if you press the tabulator, then when you try to press it again, it will try to push it again, so you have to space first. So I, I found interestingly that you can do this in order to cycle. Well, this is just with the way I've arranged all these tabs. There's a bunch of different kinds of tabs that you can use. Um, that Okay, I'll, I'll reserve that for the Remington video. That'll be sometime from now, but... So, now you've seen how the tabulator works. Um, backspace feels nice and quick. A bunch of machines, they tend to... I guess Hermes, uh, or hmm, not sure which examples, but basically, typically, when you backspace, they move a bit past the the click, just um, with the way it's designed. Whereas this machine backspaces a bit more quick quickly, so it's like instead of doing two steps forward, one step back, it just does a single clean step for the most part. Um, this is the carriage release. You can see that. There's a ratchet in there. You'll also notice here that this machine has probably what I believe to be one of the earlier styles of ribbon vibrator. The purpose of the ribbon vi vibrator is to present the ribbon to the platen and then move it out of the way so you can see what you're writing. Whereas, say, on other machines, I believe we're originating with, at least with the Underwood, I'm not sure if any earlier machines than the Underwood 1 had the style of ribbon vibrator or type guide over here. Um, I mean, I guess... In terms of typewriter history, we have our Yosts here. Um, if things go properly, I might also have a nice and very clean new Yoast to <laughs> fix my dissatisfaction with this machine I got, and that got damaged in the mail. Got full refund, fortunately, but I mean, I got a taste of what the action feels like. Oh. I'll do a separate video once the new Yoast arrives. Um, this guy is the margin release. I, for the longest time, had no idea what it did. Same thing with this guy. So basically, so actually you'll reach the point where the keys are stopped from pressing the platen. You just have to press this, and you see it will engage again. As for setting the margins on this machine, um, I was pretty confused. It turned out that this thing here is actually the right margin, whereas this here is the absolute right margin. Um, I think actually, yeah, when I first received this machine, these guys 
were flipped, as in this was here, this was here. And I had to painstakingly try to disassemble this and put it around the right way and do some trial and error on the correct positioning of the left margin. So left margin basically collides with that side there. And this guy here is the release for that left margin. Um, I guess I'll have to hold, I'll have to backspace that stick. And it's hard to see from here, but might be able to see that there's a slope there. Which I believe is meant to allow one to just keep on typing past that margin. Then it will reset. Like so. And then this is the paper release. That's for the line finder to disengage. And I still feel some bumps, I'm not sure where they're from. Might be from the paper roller or something else. But once you remove that, then the click will function and this guy will just fly around freely. Um, here, it's a bit hard to read, unless I put a flashlight here. You will see the settings for your line spacing. So now, for example, that's for the two, one, two, and three, one, two, three, and back to one. That's achieved just using a little cam over there. Mm. There are eyelets in this ribbon which will help engage the automatic ribbon reverse. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna demonstrate the automatic ribbon reverse right here or try to induce its operation. Um, but just know that these guys are responsible for doing that on this machine. Paper bale. This guy likes to misbehave. Um, okay. Any other features? Okay, I guess finally it's time to type in this now lengthening video. I've provided some timestamps for you. This machine has some trouble with feeding this paper. As you can see here, for some reason there's a ledge there that it doesn't really like to get past without some effort. Now it should behave.
Okay, that should be good. And then we will get to the right margin, as you can see. So everything set. Just notice that this was a creased paper from somewhere. Anyway, so I'll still type on it. Mm. Somewhat annoying thing is of this determining whether or not you're typing at the right spot. The area, basically just know that I'll just guess. <laughs> Trying to figure out where the top is, but judging by that, it seems like good reference for deciding where or determining where the character will strike is that if you want one inch of top margin, place paper about this far. Above. Well, maybe that. Okay. Figs. Uh, the shift lock on this machine is unfortunately, for the most part, faulty. At least for the caps. Um, another comment is, for whatever the reason, the previous owner use the dual color, color ribbon, as you will see soon, is actually pretty useless on this machine or anything of that derives from the design, given that the ribbon itself can't move with respect to the platen or uh, no, with respect to the type. So what happens is you get black caps uh, where's my dash August 10 times currently 10.05 So you'll see here, it's also black here, but everything else is red, <laughs> so it's pretty weird. I mean, it works. Okay, typing. Yeah, it's a bit annoying when you don't have uh, caps keys on both sides, like on the soldier over there. It has a uh, quite nice and fast action. Also, another thing that makes typing on this machine really comfortable is how the steepness of the keyboard. Same thing on the Psalter there and the IBM Electromatic is a lot shallower than on your usual typewriter, as you can see. Quite steep, quite shallow. It's basically or, um, yeah, many decades before the first computer keyboard. I mean, that machine there was first produced in, like, 1930, 
find or something. And this one quite earlier. Anyways, um, so yeah, you get a decent idea of what it feels like to type on this machine. If you use this lever here, you can lock the margin so that it's always released. This thing, I finally realized, is in fact the touch control. You have to screw it in and we'll tighten the spring. Um, one other thing about a number of older machines is that the escapement tends to get engaged much earlier in the stroke as compared to some other machines where or at least it starts moving the escapement rocker much earlier, whereas here you have to like press all the way in before the escapement is really engaged. That makes for a smoother feel generally, though for machines like the Smith Premier over there at the far right, it does make for a nice and interesting feel. Where, same thing with the Remington number no. 6 or any of their abstract machines, which generally tend to also have an earlier escapement actuation. <laughs> and I guess right now I'm assuming you guys know about typewriters and know what an escapement is. Um, time now to show you what the innards look like. Two thumb screws, the one of the thumb screws for the ribbon I'm missing. Ah, actually this guy, the red used to be on the bottom. Oh, how convenient. We're about to encounter an automatic ribbon reverse. <laughs> well, anyways, now you can now see. Let's make sure this tripod doesn't fall. The innards. So, basically you can see that. That's the escapement. There's the escape wheel over there. And there's a spring. If I tighten that screw, and I can pull on this lever, which will make that spring tighter. Um, but we won't do that for now, but at least you know it's there. And I uh, typically for almost all my machines for everything to be at the slightest setting. Um, oh, I see. Actually, it's now winding in this direction. Oh, that's because the ribbon reverse already engaged. Well, that's going to be another blue moon for now. Except in the most rigorous session of typing. Okay.
have from this view. Let's see what else. missed when I'm typing fast is the spacebar of some machines. Anyways, that was the Empire number two. Now, before I close, I'll show you another thrust action typewriter. It was actually my 13th acquisition right after the Empire number two. So the Empire number two, Canadian machine, was produced after the Empire number one, which came after the Wellington, which was an American machine. So the Wellington was the original. I don't remember what year it was produced, but they got licensed off, I believe, to Canada, then Canada, or at least a Canadian company. That Canadian company, Empire, produced their machines and eventually licensed off the European Adler, which I believe started off producing thrust action machines. Um, those ones would have looked a lot more like that Empire with variation. This machine dates back to 1947, or 249 rather. So 1947 to 1949, as you can see, some variations to the mechanism, this time only two rows of type for just a basic shift mechanism, no fix key, German quartz layout. Uh, this machine still needs to be cleaned, but you can see even down to the ribbon vibrator, the principle is the same. And unfortunately, they also still have that the position of the ribbon cannot be adjusted with respect to the type. So you have no like, color selection or anything. So, you, know, you already know what these guys look like when they're flying quickly. Lastly, I will show you um, what was actually my first typewriter acquisition. Oh yeah, this guy was shipped all the way from Croatia. <laughs> So that was fun. Oh, yeah, and uh, Tampire number two, of course, came from within Canada. So, lastly, uh, it's probably too heavy to. Mm, I'll try <laughs> carrying this. It is the. I swear this is my heaviest typewriter heavier than the SG-1, which I think is a bit heavier than the Hermes. Yeah, this machine's probably also even heavier than... Oh dear. Oh goodness. That's a heavy machine. Underwood noiseless with a wide carriage. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this monster. So... That was my first typewriter. Um, 
it arrived. I don't know whether that happened during shipping or beforehand. This guy was forward too far. And that caused problems. Now, Remington originally got this from some other company, probably the original noiseless typewriter company. Um, same thing. Yeah, I'm not an expert on the history of the standard and... Uh, okay, yeah, I think the... I can probably find another video because I'm not going to bring my Remington noiseless upstairs right now. As you can see, yeah, very similar bust action design. And I'd say this is a lot more akin to the usual press action than the portable version of this mechanism. I'd say actually the portable version of has a motion more similar to the else, though I could probably make that comparison in a different video. This one's already getting long enough. Still have to spool some ribbon, but you can see already the typeface of this mechanism now has four rows of type instead of three or two, and the mechanism is designed to index to the appropriate one. So the bottom two rows of the keyboard will also use the bottom two rows of the, well, I guess also given shifting of the typeface. And the whole point of a noiseless mechanism is to basically incorporate a special mechanism that prevents this guy from just completely whacking into the platen and making noise. So in the end, all you really hear is the sound of the action, which is a lot more bassy and rattly, as opposed to uh, Gonna sacrifice just one. You normally don't want to do that to a typewriter without any paper in there, but as you can hear, it's louder. Uh, so that's it. The Empire number two sitting back there. Adler Favri 2. Favri 2, I believe. Yes. And the Underwood Noises.